All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us in celebrating the hard work and meaningful research taking place in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. My name is Adam Keeley. I'm going to help uh, guide us through the competition today. And we'll start off with a quick message from Christine Kelly. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Adam. And hi, everybody. And thank you all so much for joining this afternoon's presentation of the third annual three minute thesis competition, showcasing the research of masters and doctoral students at Fordham University's Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. As Adam mentioned, I'm Christine Kelly, and I serve as Assistant Dean for Student Professional Development at GSAS. Today, I and Adam Keeley, my co-organizer, a candidate for a master's degree in international political economy and development, are really happy to welcome you to today's event. We're really grateful to have a wide range of participants joining us from across the Fordham University community, including our competition contestants, judges, students, alumni, staff, and friends far and wide. Welcome one and all. The Graduate School of Arts and Sciences is delighted for the opportunity today to share the research of hardworking and innovative students who are the heart and soul of the Fordham GSAS community. The Graduate School of Arts and Sciences is proud to house over 50 graduate programs and certificate options situated across a range of disciplines in the humanities, hard sciences, and social sciences, as well as a number of robust professional programs that cultivate thought leaders who are well prepared for the 21st century workforce. The three minute thesis competition is also sponsored and organized by GSAS Futures, a program that augments the skill sets and career preparation of students in the graduate school and is powered in large part by graduate students on behalf of their peers. As I'm sure you all can imagine, we entered the 2019-2020 academic year, excited to offer the Fordham community an in-person competition facilitated this year by not one, but two rounds held throughout the spring 2020 semester. Our intentions, like many of the best laid plans this year, came to a halt by the rapid onset of the COVID-19 pandemic and the university's subsequent transition to remote operations to preserve the health and safety of all members of our community. Even as we moved to cancel or postpone the 3MT competition, we were really thrilled to learn that many 3MT participants welcome the prospect of moving forward with the competition on a virtual basis. I want to thank our students for their more than admirable demonstration of adaptability and resilience, and for their unyielding commitment to their research. In an era when the future is too often wrought with uncertainty and anxieties of many kinds, they, like all of those who remain hard at work on behalf of our human community, give us good reason for hope. I also wanna extend a special thanks to those who've made this event possible. Allow me to thank Adam Keeley for the ingenuity and resolve that he brought to both envisioning and making a reality this event today. To Dr. Jay Breyer, a GSAS alum who earned his doctorate in psychometrics and quantitative psychology in 1981, and who now serves as chair of the GSAS Dean's Leadership Committee for the time, creativity, and commitment that he brings time and again to the graduate school the wider Fordham University community, and specifically to the annual 3MT competition. To GSAS Interim Dean, Melissa Labonte, for her ceaseless dedication to supporting the graduate student experience, and to this year's panel of judges, drawn from Fordham faculty, students, and alumni for their careful ass assessment of 3MT presentations. Allow me to just briefly say a few words about 3MT. The three-minute thesis 
is a research communication competition developed by the University of Queensland in 2008. Since then, over 700 universities worldwide have launched 3MT competitions of their own. The competition rules are simple, but I'm sure our contestants would agree that they are no less challenging for it. Students are invited to present on an active research project. This could include a master's thesis, a dissertation, a publishable article, or a related deliverable. In three minutes or less, accompanied by no more than a single static PowerPoint slide. Judges assess presentations using two broad rubric categories, comprehension and content and engagement in communication. So today's event will consist of a viewing of contestant presentation videos, which were pre-recorded without the possibility of editing or alteration in any way followed by an opportunity for members of the audience, so that's all of you who have tuned in today, to vote on a People's Choice winner, followed by a live Q&A session with contestants, and last but not least, the announcement of competition winners. Before we move on to the next part of our program, featuring a viewing of contestant submitted presentation videos, please allow me to introduce our panel of judges. The judges who assessed 3MT presentations included Dr. Garrett Broad, an assistant professor in the Department of Communication and Media Studies and Director of Graduate Studies for the Masters of Arts in Public Media program. Alex Van Atkins, a PhD candidate in English. Alex is also Vice President of the Graduate Student Association and incoming president of the Graduate Student Association for the 2020-2021 academic year. Sal Giambanco, a 1990 GSAS alum who currently serves as a partner in the Omidyar Network and on the GSAS Dean's Leadership Committee. Dr. Maria Nardone, a 1982 GSAS alumna who now works as a psychologist and organizational consultant while serving on the GSAS Dean's Leadership Committee. Anna Rabasco, a PhD can candidate in clinical psychology and the first place winner of the spring 2019 three-minute thesis competition. And Dr. Jackie Reich, <clears throat> professor and chair of the Department of Communication and Media Studies and interim chair of the Department of Classics. So at this time, Adam will play the presentation videos that were crafted by seven 3MT participants who represent a range of arts and sciences disciplines, including biological sciences, economics, history, and psychology. Following the presentations, members of the audience will have an opportunity to vote for a People's Choice winner by selecting their favorite presentation using a poll feature that will appear on the screens of all attendees. So please keep this in mind while watching. And with that, I'm now going to turn things back over to Adam, who will help us play our contestant videos. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you so much, Christine. All right, so we'll jump right into the presentations now. And remember that we will have a Q&A session later on. So be sure to note down any questions you may have. Hi, my name is Maria Aparcero Cero. I'm in the Clinical Psychology PhD program. The title of my three minute thesis presentation is, Can Psychology Identify Faking in Court? Would you be willing to lie to keep your freedom or gain financial compensation? Research examining defense attorney practices has shown that they usually prepare their clients and even train them to undergo psychological testing. These present clear ethical concerns and challenges for psychological evaluations conducted within the legal system. Evaluating faking is a common practice in psychological evaluations, but do our psychological tests identify individuals who have been trained to fake symptoms? 
This is the question that motivated my research project. My goal was to evaluate the effectiveness of a commonly used personality and psychopathology test on detecting fakers. Although TV shows like Lack to Me suggest we can identify faking with a keen eye for facial expressions, that suggests we're not very good at it. Therefore, we build tests designed to identify fakers. My research included a total of 101 studies and over 21,000 participants. Some of the participants were patients that responded to the test honestly, and others were asked to fake symptoms. Among the fakers, there were three groups. The first group was not given any help. The second group was provided information on a specific disorder they had to fake. And the third group was told how to respond to specific questions within the test. All the studies compare honest patients with individuals asked to fake symptoms. As you can see in the slide, the results showed that those that were not given guidance and those that were provided information on a specific disorder scored considerably higher than honest patients and therefore were identified as fakers by the test. Notably, those that were told how to respond to certain type of questions within the test score higher than honest patients, but lower than the other faking groups. This shows providing test-taking strategy does improve faking. However, they were still identified as fakers by the test. My research demonstrated this personality and psychopathology test can help us identify fakers even if they have been trained to lie. This is good news, given that most fakers are motivated to search information to enhance their ability to simulate symptoms and elude detection. In fact, research has estimated that up to one out of five defendants in criminal cases and one out of two in civil lawsuits fake symptoms. In conclusion, we do have psychological tests to identify even trained fakers. So now that you know this, would you still be willing to lie? Hi, my name is Elise Braggard and I'm in the Applied Developmental Psychology program. The title of my three-minute thesis presentation is The Role of Sexual Agency and Peer Influences on Sexting Consequences Among Adolescent Girls. In the last decade, there has been a lot of concern in the media and among parents about adolescent sexting, which is the sending of nude or sexual images over text message or social media. One reason for this concern is because some adolescents have experienced bullying, depression, or social stigma as a result of sexting. Girls experience gender double standards when it comes to sexual behavior. For example, girls are more likely than boys to experience slut shaming from their peers. As might be expected, girls also tend to face more negative consequences of sexting than boys. In spite of this, some researchers have argued that sexting has become a normal part of adolescent sexual behavior. Now that teens use phones and technology so much, perhaps it's unsurprising that adolescent sexual experimentation has also gone digital. My thesis examines what happens when girls, like the one in this photo, decide to engage in sexting. My research asks, what are the psychological and social influences of sexting? What is her motivation to sext? And how do these factors lead to this girl experiencing either positive or negative consequences? My study will help us understand these different factors so that we can develop interventions to reduce the risk of negative consequences, such as exploitation, shame, or mental health issues. We can then help girls, like the one in this photo, make informed choices about whether she wants to send a sext. I specifically wanted to examine how sexual agency influenced sexting consequences, which means the ability to make sexual decisions free of coercion and feel entitled to sexual pleasure. We also examined social influences, such as peer and partner pressure. We conducted a survey online with 200 girls aged 14 to 18 about sexting. We found that girls with higher sexual agency, who sexted for sexual or romantic reasons, were more likely to experience positive consequences, such as improved sexual or emotional communication with a partner. 
On the other hand, we found that girls with lower sexual agency, who were vulnerable to peer pressure and who had been coerced to sex by a partner, were more likely to experience negative consequences, such as feeling ashamed or having relationship problems. Sexting isn't necessarily a risky or harmful behavior. Girls in our sample experienced higher levels of positive consequences than negative ones. So just telling girls not to sext might not be effective. My study indicates that how girls perceive their own sexual agency has a significant influence on whether they experience positive or negative consequences. We should be supporting the development of girls' sexual agency so that they can make their own sexting decisions free of peer pressure and partner coercion. Hi, my name is Ekaterina Miganova and I'm a student at biology department. The title of my 10-minute thesis presentation is Investigating Heart Hypertrophy in Flies. The main focus of my research is RNA-Z enzyme. RNA-Z is essential for tRNA molecule processing, which is required for protein synthesis. RNA-Z is suspected to cause a disease called heart hypertrophy. It is characterized by the thickening of the heart walls, which restricts the blood flow, leading to arrhythmias, heart failure, and cardiac death. Heart hypertrophy could be caused by many different factors, but if it is linked to RNA-Z, it's especially severe. Patients born with these mutations uh, don't live past infancy. Even though the association between RNA-Z and heart hypertrophy is established, it is still not clear how mutations of this gene lead to the symptoms of this disease. Uh, it is hard to conduct this study in uh, humans due to ethical constraints. Therefore, I turned to a model organism, fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster. RNA-Z is so essential that it is present in all the organisms, including flies. Even though the fly heart and human are anatomically very different, the pathways for the heart development and functions are well preserved. This makes Drosophila a great model organism to study heart diseases. For my research, I introduced the mutant RNA-Z into the flies and study fly heart to see the effect of the mutations. Uh, this is what the fly heart looks like. The circle is pointed here by an arrow. Uh, this is the wild type fly heart and here is the mutant. As you can see, the mutations of RNA-Z cause dramatic thickening of the heart wall. This finding further supports that the uh, heart hypertrophy in humans is indeed caused by mutation of RNA-Z. This also means that now I have a fly model to study the effects of this mutation. When looking for a cure for a disease, it is very important to understand the processes that lead to the symptoms of the disease so that we can stop them from uh, happening. Therefore, my next part is to investigate the underlying mechanisms leading to the heart wall thickening. This could be happening either to the fact that there are more cells in the heart tissue thickening it, or each of the cells is bigger in size. To differentiate between these two possibilities, I'm currently working on a genetic tool which will allow me to visualize each of the heart cells. This will allow me to measure the size of each of them and count the number and further continue studying after that. This research will contribute to understanding of heart hypertrophy as well as it will be a step in search for the cure. Thank you. Hi, my name is Steven Johnson and I'm in the Biological Sciences program. The title of my three-minute thesis presentation is Evolution of Field Mustard in Response to Experimental Drought. Climate change is happening right now and one aspect we are observing is increased drought. This is a big problem not only for agriculture but also for natural plant populations. One of the ways plant populations can deal with this is through evolution. I'm interested in studying how plant populations respond to drought and to do this I'm growing populations of field mustard pictured here to the right under drought conditions 
for four generations. Because I'm doing this in a experimental greenhouse setting as compared to in nature, this is called experimental drought. I've set aside seeds from before beginning to serve as ancestral representatives so that afterwards I can grow the experimental drought descendants alongside these stored ancestors at the same time. This design is called the resurrection approach and will allow me to directly examine evolutionary change. Right now I'm growing these drought descendant and ancestral populations in the greenhouse at Fordham's Lewis Calder Center. As you can see, the y-axis here is flowering time in days, which is number of days between germination and first flower for each plant. And then on the x-axis, we have the ancestral and drought descendant groups. And as you can see, the drought descendants have evolved about the six-day decrease in flowering time as a result of experimental drought. They've also evolved thinner leaves. These results are really interesting because they indicate that drought descendants are growing faster and flowering earlier in order to reproduce earlier in season in response to drought. This is called drought escape and is one of the common strategies that we see in response to drought. I've also collected tissue from these drought descendants and ancestral populations and have it sequenced, and then working through now to check for genetic differences. So it's my hope that by understanding the physical and genetic differences between these ancestral and descendant populations, we will better understand how drought adaptation occurs in field mustard. And further, because my process looks at evolution directly, this will have broader implications to help scientists better understand how populations respond to drought in a more general sense. Thank you. Hi, my name is Helene Purcell and I am an economics PhD student. Um, the title of my 3MT presentation is uh, the Heterogeneous Impacts of Natural Disasters on Risk Preferences, Evidence from Indonesia. Uh, in recent years, high-income countries have made significant strides in reducing the death toll and economic loss from natural disasters, while developing countries continue to bear the highest human costs due to exposure, poor infrastructure, low household savings, and the tendency of the poorest populations to live in remote areas where it's hard to receive aid. Indonesia sits on the Pacific Ring of Fire, a part of the Pacific coastline vulnerable to earthquakes and volcanoes. As the headlines here in this slide indicate, uh, Indonesia is frequently plagued by major disaster events, which include not only earthquakes and tsunamis, which we often hear about, but also volcanic eruptions, wildfires, floods, landslides, and even more. Given the severity of these events, they likely have significant economic and behavioral consequences. To explore this, my research analyzes the impact of natural disasters on risk preferences in Indonesia. I choose to look at risk responses because our underlying attitudes about risk shape many important economic decisions, which include savings, investment in health and education, occupational choice, and even technology adoption. Using a longitudinal household survey combined with an extensive natural da disaster data set, I test whether risk preferences measured using choices made in a hypothetical lottery game change as individuals are exposed to natural disasters. My research is unique because I can follow specific people over time, uh, which allows me to remove time invariant unobservables, and also my disaster data is extensive, so it allows me to explore the heterogeneous impact of resp the response using multiple severity measurements of disaster as well as several different types of disaster. I find that among the variety of measures used to capture severity, uh, it's actually the mortality rate of disasters that has the most significant effect on risk preferences. My data show that individuals become more risk averse as they are exposed to more deaths from disasters, while other measurements such as monetary damages, evacuations, and the number of houses destroyed don't have as significant of an impact. This is important because individuals in developing countries already have high levels of risk aversion, and further increases in these levels could lead to non-optimal decision-making. 
Additionally, I find that the effect is amplified uh, for more severe disasters, particularly earthquakes, and that women's risk attitudes are more sensitive than men's. As we begin to think about climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction policy as a global community, it's important that we understand the psychological and economic response of responses of individuals following these events. While we're not able to completely prevent disasters from occurring, this research gives insight into the human response to natural disasters and may shed light on what's important to focus on from a policy perspective, such as programs that would limit the mortality implications of these events. Thank you. Hello everyone, hope you're healthy and safe. I'm Satika Rajamani, a fourth year graduate student working in Dr. Dubrovsky's lab at the Department of Biological Sciences. The topic of my thesis is the identification of primary targets of juvenile hormone in Drosophila melanogaster. Before I jump into it, I'm going to briefly talk about, well you guessed right, insects. Insects are the most eclectic group of animals and can have both helpful and harmful effects on the ecosystem. They aid in pollination but can also transmit diseases like malaria or destroy crops like the desert locust in Africa. These adverse effects have led to an increase in the demand for developing target-specific insect control techniques, which can only be fulfilled by furthering our understanding of insect developmental regulation. To do so in our lab, we're studying the best model, Drosophila or the fruit fly. Drosophila is a holometabolous insect, goes through four distinct stages of development. The developmental transitions are dependent on the balance between juvenile hormone and ictyacin, which are two major insect hormones. The presence of juvenile hormone is required for larval-larval transitions, whereas its absence is required and crucial for metamorphosis initiation. Apart from metamorphosis, juvenile hormone also controls various other processes. So how does it do so? The current model of GH action states that it requires its receptors, methoprin tolerant, and germ cell expressed. In the presence of the hormone, the receptor binds with its cofactor, which then bind to the hormone response elements which are present in the promoters of the primary targets, which thereby regulate its gene expression. Despite many years of uh, such efforts, the entire signaling pathway of juvenile hormone has not been elucidated yet. In an effort to do so, we have created two insect models that express the epitope-tagged receptors, MetV5 and GCA3X flag, that were developed using CRISPR-Cas9 technology. These models have been used by us to track when and where the receptors are expressed. And interestingly, I have found both overlapping and unique expression of these receptors in tissues that are known to be and not associated with juvenile hormone. The chromatin will next be isolated from these tissues that express these receptors and aid us in the identification of primary targets. The isolated chromatin will be subject to cross-linking, which will stabilize the protein-DNA interactions, and then subject to sonication to produce smaller fragments, and then immunoprecipitation using commercially available antibodies against these epitopes. These complexes will now be reverse cross-linked, and the obtained DNA fragments will be aligned against the Drosophila genome to identify which putative gene targets they belong to. I call them putative because not all of the bindings can be biologically significant. To identify only those that are, I will be studying the target uh, gene expression levels in two conditions, one in the absence of JH and another in the absence of the receptor. Simply put, a true target gene's level of expression will be different in these conditions when compared to that in the wild type controls. Overall, the identification of such primary targets will further our understanding in the regulation of insect development and serve as a platform for developing target-specific insect control techniques. Thank you and hope you have a great day. Hello, my name is Michael Sanders. I'm part of the history department here at Fordham University. The title of my three minute thesis presentation is What Does Spain Have to Do with the Holy Land? Complicating the Crusades and the Clash of Civilizations Paradigm. I study the Crusades in the medieval Iberian Peninsula, modern day Spain and Portugal. During the Middle Ages, Iberia was home to large numbers of Christians, Muslims, and Jews. Gradually, the Christians from the north conquered the entire peninsula from Muslim rule on a process known as the Reconquest. Recently, scholars have become interested in connections between Christian Muslim conflicts in Iberia and the Crusades in the Holy Land. I have found a plan by a 12th century Archbishop of Santiago de Compostela that connected the two regions. 
This plan is called the Spanish Route, and it proposed that Crusaders to the Holy Land travel through Muslim Iberia and North Africa to get to Jerusalem. The Spanish Route is symbolized by the red line on the map. Now, historians have generally disregarded the Spanish Route as idiosyncratic and eccentric because it was so much more arduous than the traditional route Crusaders used. This is symbolized by the green line on the map. However, I have found by reviewing numerous chronicles, poems, philosophical treatises, and letters that the Spanish route persists throughout Iberian history. It is an idea that lasts from the 12th century all the way to the 21st. Now, my sources don't always contain a geographical route from Iberia to the Holy Land. Rather, they often discuss why Iberians, and particularly Iberian kings, were ideally suited to reconquer the Holy Land. In other words, the Spanish route was part of a larger discourse about political power. Muslim leaders also participated in this discourse on kingship across the Mediterranean world. The best example is the Kurdish Sultan Saladin, famed among Muslims and Christians in the Middle Ages and today. Saladin's fame and authority resulted largely from his conquest of Jerusalem from Crusaders in 1187. Now, Saladin's battles and indeed the entire Crusade movement have been framed largely in religious terms as a clash of civilizations. One need only think of the way the shooter justified his horrific attacks against Muslims in Christchurch, New Zealand last year. My research is part of a growing body of scholarship meant to show that the Crusades were not simply about religion. Yes, the Spanish route involved Christian-Muslim conflict, but it was more a clash of kings than a clash of religions. The Spanish route was a path to political power and legitimacy. I want to sharpen the definition of the Crusades and the Reconquest, not only for the sake of historical accuracy, but more importantly to show that terrorism, racism, and nationalism have no historical justification. Thank you. Wow, fantastic work. Congratulations to all of you on your hard work. Let's give them all a round of applause. It's really a shame that, uh, that you guys aren't in front of an audience. So I'll give you a little round of applause for my home. All right, back to you, Christine. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks, Adam. And thank you so much to all of our contestants. Just like Adam said, it's, it's, in ideal circumstances, we would have loved to experience all of this in person, but our contestants crafted such outstanding videos, and I really hope that you all enjoyed watching them as much as we did. So it's now time for today's event attendees to select a People's Choice competition winner. For all of you who are tuning in, in just a moment, you'll see a pop-up box appear on your computer screens or on the screens of the devices that you're using to tune in today. <clears throat> in the spirit of 3MT, we'd like to give you all three minutes to make your voice heard. We welcome you to vote now for a presentation to receive a People's Choice Award. And following People's Choice voting, we'll begin a live Q&A session with our amazing competition contestants. Hey, wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for taking some time to select a People's Choice winner. We're really looking forward to announcing the winners of our competition. But before we um, get to that component of our session, I'm now really looking forward to a live Q&A session with this year's 3MT contestants. So let me just take a moment to explain how the Q&A session will work for everyone. So all attendees will shortly be able to either see or to hear the voices of competition participants. And as a bit of guidance for our contestants, you all have the option next to where your names are featured under a panelist column to select to either unmute yourselves so attendees can hear your voice alone or to both unmute yourself and to turn on your webcam so that the audience can see you. That choice is entirely up to you. Uh, at this point, <clears throat> we invite members of our virtual audience to please use 
the Q&A button, which is available at the bottom center of today's webinar toolbar. You have a few different options to communicate, but we ask for this particular session that you rely on the Q&A button. I'll be able to see the questions that members of our audience submit, and we'll read your questions aloud to give our participants an opportunity to respond. We welcome you to begin submitting your questions now, and thank you. As we begin, and we take a few minutes to wait for our audience to begin submitting questions, I would love to pose a question to our contestants. If I might ask, what persuaded you all to register for this year's 3MT competition and to remain involved despite the particular pressures that came with this academic year? Add to this question? Yes. So I originally decided to, to enter the competition because I, I wanted to practice um, talking about my research for, for an audience that might not necessarily be familiar with it. And I knew I'd be going to conferences in the you know, next year and be networking and hoping to collaborate with um, other researchers. So I wanted to make sure that I really spent some time figuring out how to and really how to you know, communicate my research to other people and, and help them realize its importance and, and its relevance. Um, and then in terms of why I kind of decided to continue doing it in the virtual setting, um, I've been working on finishing up my thesis, um, which is due in a few weeks. And doing this actually really helped me to finish, you know, the conclusions on my written thesis, because as I had to think about distilling it into three minutes, it really helped me think about you know, what is, what am I trying to say? Like, what is the key takeaway from this research? And so it was a great opportunity to work on that. That's great. Thank you so much, Elise, for sharing. And now I'm going to take a moment to begin reading through some of the questions that members of our audience are submitting. So one comes from Javier for Maria. Javier asks, are the tests perform, uh, are the tests performed exclusively to detect fakers or are they embedded within the psychological tests? Hi, I cannot use my camera either, so I will just use my voice. Uh, thank you, Javier, for your question. Um, oh, so I'm here, actually. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so uh, the test is actually a broad personality and psychopathology test that actually assess for a wide range of uh, psychological symptoms, including depression, anxiety, delusions, hallucinations. And within the test, there are particular questions that form skills that have been designed to detect individuals that either exaggerate symptoms or uh, minimize symptoms. And those skills have been made of uh, symptoms that are very real, uh, that are rarely in endorsed by psychiatric patients. So are symptoms that even very, very severe patients don't endorse. So if someone is endorsing these symptoms, it's kind of giving us a red flag that perhaps th those people are trying too hard to exaggerate their symptoms. And there are other scales that just include subtle versus more obvious symptoms. So what we see in people that are trying to exaggerate or fake symptoms is that they try, they tend to endorse the obvious ones, but not the more subtle that tend to be more, uh, you know, present in honest patients. So that's just a very broad overview of the test. Thanks a million, Maria. Okay, we have a question that's come in for Helene Purcell. And this question is from Diane. Helene, can you elaborate on the impact of your term risk preferences, whether in Indonesia or in other worlds? Hi, okay, my video is working, I guess. Um, so I think what this question is asking is um, the impact of the change in risk preference um, or so, so to start off, um, in economics, we use um, risk to, uh, it, as a factor in our modeling for decision making. Um, so an impact on risk preference would uh, impact our decision making, whether it's about our savings decisions or investment decisions um, as individuals. But um, if you're talking about what the impact of uh, 
a shock that causes a change in risk preferences. In my particular context in Indonesia and um, with natural disasters, it could be that people that face natural disasters become more risk averse and then are therefore um, less willing to adopt uh, new technology uh, such as farming and agricultural technologies and things like that. So when we think about policy uh, that would be directed towards climate change, maybe it isn't, um, it's more about preventing that change in risk preference, whether it's putting um, early warning systems in place or stronger evacuations so that we reduce the mortality versus um, the more reactionary uh, policies that uh, you know might say, okay, let's invest in this uh, seed technology that would be more resistant to these types of disasters, and then people aren't adopting it anyways because there's been this change in risk preference. I hope that somewhat answers your question. Thanks so much, Helene. It appears that we now have a question for Ekaterina. Michelle asks, how will the study of, her, of hypertrophy help humans? Is there a difference in the gene response by gender of the flies. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, so I've heard two questions. How the study is gonna help humans? Also, if there's difference between males and females. Well, uh, how it's gonna help humans, uh, as I said, the pathways, the gene pathways, which lead to disease uh, up to 60% preserved. And what I'm doing right now, I'm identifying these pathways in a simpler model, which is Rosophila, which later can be tested in humans to see if it's true, if it is conserved. So I am starting to unravel in the pathway of the disease, which later will be converted into mammal and into human studies in search of actual disease. Uh, the second question is uh, about the differences between males and females. There are always differences between males and females in many, many processes, at least in flies. Uh, and I'm talking only about uh, biological processes. Uh, but uh, I did not study, uh, I did not have two groups, males versus females. I always have mixed gender, so I cannot answer this question. Thank you. Thanks a million, Ekaterina. And now we have a question that's come in uh, from Dean Melissa Levanti for all of our contestants. Melissa writes, I would love to hear from the students in this impressive group about what brought them to the particular areas of research they shared with us today. So what inspired you all? Hi, I'm Satvika. I think I'm going to answer the question if that's okay. Wonderful, Satvika. Thank you. Okay. So uh, for me, I think it was, uh, I mean, you, I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys could have like visually seen the excitement when I was talking about how much I love working with the fruit fly. It's uh, because it has a wonderful set of genetic tools. It's like the coolest model organism. I'm biased, but like it's the coolest organism to work with. So a lot of the uh, coming of age technologies like CRISPR and there are more technologies that are being developed like every single day that uh, that I'm able to use for my own research which I just love and uh, my PI uh, like gives me the freedom to use them so I guess that's what kind of motivated me to like you know work in the lab and like get this research done it's the cool genetic tools that's what it is. Okay, terrific. Thanks again, Sadvitka. And now we have a question that's come in from Fordham Foundry, and it appears that it's directed at Michael Sanders. Fordham Foundry asks, what impact, if any, do you think that the African route to Jerusalem had on the cultural development of the countries through which it passed? Or was there an acrimonious relationship between the residents of the countries and the Crusaders. Hi. Um, sure, thank you for the question. Um, I think one of the first things to point out is um, the Spanish route, part of the history of ideas, um, they didn't ever really get too far along the route. Um, the farthest they got is in the 16th century up to Tunis. Um, but it, it's 
um, what's interesting to me about this topic especially is on the one hand, it is about Spanish expansion, Castilian expansion, Aragonese expansion. You don't really have Spain in the Middle Ages. You have different kingdoms. And the Spanish route is one way that they're all coming together in one dialogue. But the other interesting thing about it is this is just not limited to Iberia. So this discourse with Jerusalem, um, certainly Jerusalem has always been a sacred city for the three Abrahamic religions throughout history. But what's unique with this Spanish route discourse is that it's really about politics and really every faith group has a part in it. Um, I pointed out Saladin um, in my um, presentation, but you even have Jewish thinkers um, proposing ways to kind of set up a new Jewish state in Jerusalem. Um, so it, it definitely, um, it definitely can underlie acrimony between the three faiths. Uh, and indeed, I think one of the things I, I point out, I mean, my dissertation is, again, you can trace this all the way to the modern era. And one of the things, um, that it's used for in the modern era is colonialism, particularly in Morocco. You have a lot of historians in Spain talking about their country and its relations to the Holy Land in this time. But again, it, it's just, it's not just a Western discourse. It's, it's not just a European version of Manifest Destiny. Um, it's a wider political discourse that I think helps us better understand history and helps us to clear up misconceptions today. Wonderful. Thanks a million, Michael. And now we have a question, which I believe is for Stephen Johnson. Michelle asks, why did you choose the mustard plant and not another common food plant eaten by humans? Hi, uh, thank you for the question. Um, so yeah, as you, as you said, um, field mustard is a, related to many crops. Um, so it's a good plant to use for that reason. But um, the main reason I used field mustard is because my advisor, Dr. Steve Franks, um, he observed that field mustard was able to um, advance flowering to adapt to a, a strong drought in California between 1999 and 2004. So um, because we had already seen that happen in nature, what I wanted to do was take field mustard seeds into a greenhouse setting where I had more control over the drought um, and could measure more traits and really look uh, at a bunch of traits to see how this happened. Um, in field mustard. So again, thanks for the question. Thanks so much, Stephen. Now we have a question for Elise. William asks, how does one measure sexual agency? Hi, thanks for the question. So we measured sexual agency using a self-report questionnaire. So girls are really answering questions about their perceived sexual agency. Um, and it covered issues such as their entitlement to sexual pleasure, their efficacy achieving sexual pleasure, their sexual body esteem. Um, and then we use this scale to kind of give them an average sexual agency score. Um, it's not the it's not the most ideal measure um, in that when we use self-report scales, it's possible that there is some kind of social desirability uh, bias happening. And certainly um, in a future, uh, future research ideas could include things like um, experimental designs or longitudinal measures, because this was only a cross-sectional design and we can only really look at how these girls were feeling there and then in the moment they took the questionnaire and it, you know, it might change from day to day or from one, one month to the next, depending on perhaps if they're in a relationship or not or what experiences they've had. Uh, but we do try and account for some of those potentially confounding um, issues such as whether they're in a relationship or if they're sexually active or um, other kind of personal characteristics. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a valid measure. It's, it's definitely been used before and been proven well, shown to be um, reliable, but it's, there's probably some work we can do to um, improving the way we can measure sexual agency. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Elise. And now we have a question which I think applies to all of our contestants today. Michelle asks, did you find any information in your research 
that surprised you? I could answer that question, but I can also give uh, other participants the opportunity to also have the opportunity to answer the question. But I can be brave. Uh, so <laughs> actually, um, so as if you remember, I include uh, honest patients, but then I have three group of fakers. The ones that were not given information, the one that were told uh, kind of the typical symptoms of a disorder that they needed to fake, and then the third one that was uh, kind of told how to respond to a particular question. But uh, it was very interesting that actually those that were not given information and those that were told like the symptoms of the disorder, they were not significantly different. So actually that was very interesting because I was guessing if we give uh, you know, the participants, oh, these are the typical symptoms that those are the ones that you should be endorsing in the test, that therefore they would be better fakers. But in reality, they were not significantly different from those that were not given any information. So that was pretty interesting funding. Yeah. Thanks, Maria. And I see Michael here as well. Michael, if you'd like to speak to this question. Yeah. Um, you know, I kind of my whole project surprised me um, in a lot of ways because it started um, with one eccentric thinker. It actually wasn't the originator of the idea in Santiago de Compostela, but it was um, Ramon Lowell, who was a philosopher, missionary, kind of looked at as the Shakespeare of Catalonia. Um, and because he's a big promoter of this idea and he's eccentric, you know, when you first hear about it, you think, oh, this is, this is just some idiosyncratic, very singular thing. But then it keeps popping up again, again, and again. And I mentioned, you know, you can all go all the way to colonialism in Morocco, but another one um, that was very surprising, Again, when you have the turn from the medieval to the modern with um, Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain, the Catholic monarchs, the ones who fund Columbus, one of the ways Columbus justified his voyages to the New World was by saying this would help fund the Spanish route. Um, and so it's very surprising to see this idea that supposedly medieval have such an effect in the modern world. And it's so helpful for teaching. You know, when you teach the Middle Ages, one of the big struggles you have for students is to impress upon them how important this is, why this stuff still matters. And so um, it was very nice for me that I could tie my research into the classroom like that. That's great. Thanks so much, Michael. Would any of our other contestants like to speak to that question? Okay, so with that, we have many more questions coming in. And I do apologize uh, to everybody whose question uh, we were not able to present to participants but I encourage all of our attendees today to please stay in touch with the graduate school and to reach out to individual contestants to learn more about their amazing, really thought-provoking projects. Uh, thank you so much. And with this, uh, we will conclude our Q&A session for today. Uh, and again, thank you so much to all of you, to our contestants, to our attendees, for just the, the, the palpable enthusiasm um, that's evident in our, our virtual community today. And so now I would like for us to turn our attention to Dr. Jay Breyer. As founder of the Fordham GSAS, the Three Minute Thesis Competition, we're really grateful to Jay for all that he's done to introduce 3MT to Fordham, advise graduate student participants, and promote the competition's continued growth over the last three years. And so now, without further ado, Jay is going to announce our competition winners. Hang on, Jay, you're muted. You're muted. Let me unmute you. Okay. Oh, okay. We can hear you now. Uh, to all the contestants and uh, also uh, very, very well done presentations today. Really terrific. But unfortunately, we have to pick some winners and there are a number of them. So first, I want to talk about third place, and third place goes to Stephen Johnson, Evolution of Field Mustard in Response to Evolutionary Drought. That's third place. Let's give him a virtual uh, round of applause. Second place is Michael Sanders, Forgotten Roads to Jerusalem, Spanish Connections to the Holy Land from the Middle Ages to the, to the modern era. And finally, 
First place, Elise Brigard, the role of sexual agency and peer influences on perceived sexting consequences among adolescent girls. And the People's Choice Award, which is also very uh, important, goes to Elise Brigard. So congratulations to all, a fine job done for, by everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jay. And please allow me also to extend such a warm congratulations to all of our competition winners and to all of our competition participants. You should all be so proud. We're so proud of you. Many, many congratulations. Thank you again to our dedicated contestants, our competition judges, to the staff who've made this event possible, and to all of you who tuned in to our event today. You all just mean so much to us and we're so grateful for all of your uh, investment in so many ways in our student community. So we've now reached the conclusion of our annual three minute thesis competition. To learn more about the Fordham GSAS 3MT competition, please visit fordham.edu slash 3MT and we absolutely invite you all to stay in touch, both with our contestants to learn more about the wonderful work that they're doing and to stay in touch with the Graduate School. You can follow um, <clears throat> the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences on social media. We're available on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And please contact us directly by emailing studentgsas, that's student, S-T-U-D-E-N-T-G-S-A-S at Fordham.edu. Stay safe, healthy, and well in every way, everyone. And we really hope to see you all again soon. Thank you so much and goodbye. <laughs>